Hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited to talk about this. Um, just FYI, you don't really need to be incredibly conversant in high performance computing or to know about compile time or SIMD stuff. Compile time for us just means um, dynamic programming, or we pre computed some things and we're reusing them later. Um, and I had a lot of fun on this project. I learned a lot of things. I hope you can learn some things too. Um, here's what it's about. Uh, you have a lot of time series data. People use this in particle physics and finance, econometrics, what have you. But you really need to smooth it fast. So we don't want it to be as spiky you know, as it usually can be. You want to take some average of some sort. And you also want this average to hold some of the statistical properties that it had. So the variance, the kurtosis, like, you, and you should be able to specify how many of these you're interested in preserving. So there's a name for this. It's called the savitsky golay filter or a weighted moving average or a rolling window average or a convolution. There's a bunch of different names. Um, but for our purposes, it's just a dot product with one vector being pre-computed. And the vector that's pre-computed is the one that we can do the compile time magic on. Um, the crate that I built is already registered on crates.io. It's called stage SG filter. It's a more specific case. It's not as functional as the SciPy version, but it does have some performance benefits. Um, but I think it's more than that, a really cool learning opportunity because it turns out dot products just are so amenable to perform uh, to performance optimizations on a lot of levels. And they let you get your sink your teeth in with a lot of really cool tools. And you see them everywhere. Um, also, I, I mentioned that we can pre-compute this com these coefficients and that's interesting in and of itself because we'll see some techniques to get there. So if you've never heard of uh, dot products, they're basically just a binary operation on two vectors and then a reduction. So in Julia, I would write that code like this and you know get a single line, that's it. That's my dot product implementation or just use the, the Unicode character. But if you sort of open your mind to the algorithm, like you can abstract it away and you can think about it on vectors of characters. And if you map unequals, that's the Hamming distance. And if you have bit vectors, then the new rage is these rags for LLMs. And they're using something called exact binary vector search. And those can really speed up your computation. So dot products, you can just keep on finding, they keep on popping everywhere. And I think that's fun. <clears throat> so let's talk about the benchmark. You know, what's state of the art or what's really available, what's out there available today? I compared to SciPy. So I have found uh, the savitsky Galay implementation on 100 million floats to take about 1.3 seconds on the 32-bit case and 1.7 on the 64-bit case. Uh, this lets us know that it's not memory bound yet. So we're pulling in twice as much data in the 32-bit version. It's not going twice as fast. So we really need to think about how we're doing the crunching. Um, also, I've run into some benchmarking issues and you'll see that the Rust version is barely faster than the SciPy version, but I have a Julia version, which was the original code that I port started porting, which is much faster. So all the benchmarking errors are mine. I probably uh, goofed it up. Do let me know, pull request open. Um, this is the Julia implementation for stage filters, the package that I previously wrote, and that's based on a lot of other people's work. Um, so it's 22 times faster than SciPy in one case and about 13 times faster in the 64-bit case. And we do get that doubling of speed if you double the width, the bit width too. So that's really cool. Um, so in Rust, I coded this and using uh, Devon, a really cool benchmarking crate, um, I had a about two times faster than SciPy uh, result, right? So which is four, 520 milliseconds and then about a second in the 64-bit case. And this is what I'm going to be talking about uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, um, just if you want to see a nice table, at some point when you're doing this uh, really intensive CPU benchmarking, you have to start thinking about in terms of, you know, how many elements you're processing per second. So we processed about 100 million elements in a second in the Rust 64-bit version. And then you can start thinking about it in terms of computer cycle and clock cycles, right? So the Julia version is pulling in about one and a half elements per nanosecond. It's almost a clock cycle on my computer, which is about one to the... Uh, one times 10 to the 11 uh, peak flops. And so Rust is leaving some performance on the table. I have some intuition as to why. I think some of the loads that are happening are just not as optimal, but we'll see where the, um, I'm still not sure where this difference is coming from. Um, ideally, however, if you do inspect the assembly that comes out of these uh, different in implementations, uh, you'll get something that looks like this. So there's a VF, so vectorize fuse multiply add two three one ss. So what this means for us is 
or really good news because we're coding a doc product. And the doc product is basically a series of fuse multi vectorized fuse multiply ads. So that's that's great. That means that we're really getting to the hot part of the loop. Um, if you want to extend this for AVX 5.2, that'd be really cool. Um, but let's talk about what goes into getting you this, this tight loop. So this is where we try to put all of the const things into uh, the code. So basically just Use dynamic programming, pre-compute them all up front. Don't do them during runtime or at every iteration. There's another Rust crate that does a linear solve at every iteration of the um, code, and it just takes a, a lot more time because they're doing something suboptimal. So also try to avoid uh, mutation with iterators. And it's very important to set the Rust flags to target the native CPU and to explicitly use the fuse multiply add. Um, lastly, I'll try to talk about how you know, when you're trying to test these things out, it's important to go um, one thing at a time because your intuition will break at some point and I have a really interesting case of where it did when I was just testing out uh, snippets of code and I scared the bejesus out of a compiler engineer of Swift. So this is what the Rust implementation looks like. There's a, you'll see on the first uh, hand emoji that there's a use of the const generics, squeeze it in there. And then that lets you pull in the coefficients later on uh, with the get coefs. Um, second, there's the using the iterator idioms. If you don't know about Windows, take a, take a trip down to iter tools or into the standard library. There's a lot of very useful um, functionality there. Um, so th this coefficient function, um, I wish I could have done this at compile time. The Julian implementation does this through a lot of uh, sh shenanigans with something called stage functions or generated functions. Unfortunately, const floating point options are not yet soon, are not yet uh, stabilized in Rust but they might be soon, maybe. It's not clear to me yet. Um, but I really tried to put in as much of that of the work as I could up front. I tried to use an algebra and other or NDRA, and just they just wouldn't um they weren't helpful for me for getting um ahead of the Rust compiler and having a generic code because I want this to work for um different parameters of M and the window and the M. Um, second of all, the passing this information down to your, the functions is what's important. This is where we're trying to obviate the need for indices. So this is what the kind of code that you end up with. If you don't if you're if you're not sure if this is happening, try using cargo remark. It's a very useful, you know, tapping into the LVM internals to see, you know, what the auto vectorizer is spitting out is like, hey, this didn't help me vectorize, auto vectorize a loop. Try using that. Um, and so this is where I also started to worry about known constant trip counts or knowing if my loop was only going to run a certain amount of times. And this is where I ran into the really cool, uh, the really funky example that I mentioned previously. Um, let me just go into this for a second, which is um, this small tidbits of just pulling in away one function at a time. I wrote the dot product like this, but I had to use cargo remark to test out, is the fold going to be optimal? Is the MOLAD actually pulling through? Am I, can I pull out the assembly with cargo ASM and see if those things are actually working? And that's what led me to adding the flags into the compile time invocation and all that stuff. Um, I could try using an exact size iterator. So this is one of the examples that I was trying out uh, as part of unit tests. This is an example where I would have thought, oh, this is just adding one uh, just 0.5, 148 times. So r the Rust compiler should be able to figure this out. And, you know, it kind of doesn't, but it does a, it unrolls the loop. Um, but if you change the trip count to 149, it just repeats the same instruction 149 times. And that is pretty bad. In fact, it's so bad that I managed to scare the bejesus out of uh, one of the Swift numerics uh, compiler engineers. Um, so even when you're building out performance sensitive code, it's very important to keep on testing your intuition. Um, thanks to Jubilee and all the USMD gang. Uh, that's all I have for now. Amazing. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, it was very interesting. Um, are there any uh, questions for Miguel? I'm do I use portable SIMD and how do I deal with unaligned data? Um, I'm not using portable SIMD yet. I do plan to. This is one of the first steps of like just getting it out and functional. I have I don't have a strategy for unaligned data yet. And I think that's where a lot of the performance problems are coming in for the code. Uh, could you use unsafe cast const U64 to F64 to get this in compile time? Oof. I don't, I wouldn't trust myself doing that. <laughs> Um, just because of um, rounding. Um, it's very, very tricky to get that right. And there's a lot of these 
um, coefficients that really need precisions in the last digits. So I don't know, M maybe. <laughs>